I'm putting in. Today's menu is a sprig of parsley and two soybeans. Huh? Enjoy. What does the word diet mean to you? It means that someone wants to lose weight when they think they're fat and they eat healthy foods. Giving up all the fattening food like grease, fat and like chips. They just lose weight, lose all their calories. You don't eat meat or chocolate or anything like that. Most people associate the word diet with losing weight. But what the word diet really means is simply the food that we eat. And food can be a complicated business. Think of the body as a machine. In order for my car to run, it needs petrol. And petrol is the car's fuel. But people are a lot more complex than cars. In order to keep a human body functioning, we need many different fuels. The human body gets its fuel from food. <laughs> We need fuel for energy to move around and keep ourselves warm. But unlike cars, we also need it for growth and repair. If cars were able to grow when we kept on filling their tanks with petrol, we'd all end up driving around one of these. But what do we mean by fuel? If you burn a piece of toast, it's acting as fuel in very much the same way as a piece of coal or wood. It starts to smoulder, eventually it catches fire. Then the bread releases energy very quickly as heat. If you eat a piece of toast, your body also uses the bread as fuel. But your body has a way of releasing the energy much more slowly and gradually. The energy we get from food is measured in kilojoules. Different foods provide us with different amounts of energy. With the energy you get from eating a single slice of buttered toast, you could cycle for about 20 minutes, sleep for two hours, or swim 10 lengths of an average sized pool. Different activities use up different amounts of energy. Just watching a football match, for instance, doesn't use up nearly as much energy as I would do if I were one of the players. If I ate like a player and didn't work like one, though, I'd soon be in trouble. So what does a footballer eat? Ray Wilkins has played for a number of British and European clubs. I take in buckets and buckets of pasta. Now, whether it's helping, I don't know. That's up to other people to say. But I take in a hell of a lot of pasta and, and jacket potatoes and boiled potatoes and whatever. And I think, without any question of a doubt, that it's definitely helped me um, last as, as long as I have done. <laughs> After the match, we would generally take in a lot of the sports drinks that are on the market at the moment. Um, I personally would sit down with a cup of tea, but I'm a lot older than the rest of the lads, but a cup of tea with a lot of sugar in it as well, uh, to try and get some sort of energy back in. Ray Wilkins pays close attention to his diet. However, this has not always been the case. I can always remember when I first started playing, our pre-match meal was an eight ounce fillet steak. And that three hours before you're actually going to play a game now is, has been proven it's absolutely ludicrous to take on board. It was only really when I went across to Italy that I was really educated in the sort of foods to eat. Um, for instance, when we have meat in this country as our meal, it's normally the major part of our meal, where in Italy it's the, it's the minor part of the meal and the vegetables and the pasta are the, the majority. And I think that was one of the first things I learned anyway. And uh, I attempt to live in the same vein now. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. For these apprentices, circuit training helps to build the stamina they need for the game. But British football clubs are beginning to realise the importance of nutrition in maximising their players' potential. Crystal Palace has brought in Karen Reid, a sports dietitian, to give them advice. It's important not to fill up just on the chicken, but to fill up on all the rice as well, because that will give you plenty of energy. 
Every so often, if you fancy a chocolate bar or a packet of crisps, what do you do? Um, I do have them still. You do have them still? Yeah. As often? Um, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. those sorts of snacks, like chocolate and crisps, the crisps have a lot of fat in, and the chocolate has a lot of fat and sugar, and it's not the healthiest way to get your energy. So you could choose something like a currant bun or having a fruit scone. Those are good ways to get energy. Or choosing something like a banana. That would be a really good snack between meals rather than having the crisps or the chocolate bar. My general advice is to think about refueling after each training session, after each period of exercise, and to prepare for a game well by eating plenty of high carbohydrate foods, the pasta, bread, rice, cereals, and potatoes at their meals and snacks before a match and before training, and also to have plenty of fluids. I think players are becoming more aware now of what to eat, especially before games, uh, and they are making I think brave efforts to put it right within our game. Everybody needs to eat a well-balanced diet, but how do we know which foods to select? We need many nutrients on a daily basis in order to stay healthy. Most foods are full of nutrients. In a market like this, you can buy all the nutrients our bodies need. There are three main nutrient groups in foods, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Hi. Hi. What's that? That's, That's interesting. cassava. What do you do with it? Well, you peel it up, chop it, and boil it. It's a bit like potato. Carbohydrates are a high energy food, and root vegetables are a good source. Thank you. Other foods high in carbohydrates are bread, cereals, pasta and rice, and fruits, which contain natural sugars. Protein is needed for growth. It gives us energy and helps to build the body. Up to the age of 18, your body's making new cells all the time in order to grow. But once an adult, new cells are formed to replace the old ones over about seven years. Fish is really rich in protein, so is meat and cheese. Fats are the highest energy food source. They digest very slowly in the body. If you eat more than your body needs, layers of fat can form underneath the skin. But you do need a certain amount of fat to help crush in the internal organs, protect the bones, and insulate you from the cold. Many of the foods we eat are very high in fat. But that's not all. There are other parts to our daily diet that we need in order to stay healthy. There are very many different minerals and vitamins that we need, each of which does a different job in the body. For instance, vitamin C helps us to heal when we cut ourselves. Vitamin D helps to build up strong bones, as do many minerals, such as calcium, that we find in dairy products, especially in milk. If you eat a good, balanced diet of fresh food, you should get all the vitamins and minerals that you need. There are all kinds of opinions about what we should and shouldn't eat. Let's take a look at a popular meal, the hamburger. Hi, Pete. Hi, Helen. Come and sit down, Pete. Dr. Peter Rowan knows a lot about what goes into foods. Pete, if you know so much about food... Why am I eating a burger? burger? Helen, this is really a good, well-balanced meal. I mean, in here, you've got meat, which has got protein and fat. The bread's got carbohydrate. Vitamins over here. So this is a good, well-balanced meal. Maybe not something you should eat for every meal, but a good meal. So why do people say it's so bad for you? I'm not sure. I think it's because they don't really understand a lot about food. OK, if you ate this every day and you were taking in these kind of animal fats all the time, not doing any exercise maybe, then it perhaps wouldn't be so good for you. But as part of an overall well-balanced diet, this is perfectly all right for growth, for energy, and maybe the next meal you have is fresh fruit, and you balance things that way. So is there anything else we should know about this food? Well, there can be things hidden in food that you're not aware of. Helen, maybe you'd just like to put a little bit more ketchup in there. Now, in that ketchup, which is very tasty, there's quite a lot of sugar. And sugar in excess can be harmful. It can affect your teeth. So you've got to be careful. You've got to know what's in your food. You're putting it into your body. Um, there's no such thing as junk food, but there's junk diets. 
And so you are what you eat. As you sit there before me, apart from the oxygen that you breathed in, you are made of all the food that you've taken in. You'd be surprised how similar you and I are to a hamburger. There's a, I mean, the hamburger is smaller, but for its size, there's the same amount of fat in there as it is in your body and my body. This, is about, this meal is about half water. And there's an awful lot of water in your body. About 63% of your body is water, enough to fill your Wellington boots six times. So we're all basically the same thing then? Yeah, we're basically hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and several other elements. They're in the food, and we take them in and build our bodies up with them, which is why we are what we eat. How much sugar, for instance, is in me? Right, about that much. That's, shall we say, a good jam jar full of sugar. You can't see it, but it's in there. Um, let me show you something else. I picked this nail up outside. That's a nail made of iron, and there's about the same amount of iron in there as there is in your body. In your body, it's carrying oxygen, it's making your blood red. Salt. There's about six salt cellars of salt in your body, and phosphorus found in bones. There's enough phosphorus in your body to make 2,200 matches which light the candle on our dinner table. Well, that gives us something to think about. But hamburger and chips may not be everybody's idea of a perfect meal. In fact, over the last 10 years, the number of vegetarians in this country has more than doubled. In the UK, vegetarianism has increased amazingly. And that has to be down to the increased amounts of information that young people can get their hands on nowadays. And vegetarianism has also increased because it's so much easier to do. You go into any supermarket now or any restaurant and vegetarian options are everywhere. And also it can't hurt that half of Take That, for example, are vegetarian. Um, the, the image of vegetarianism has changed. It's not cranks anymore. It's now mainstream people that most people want to emulate. Kate Coyne has been a professional dancer for six years. I decided when I was about 14 that I wasn't going to eat meat anymore because I didn't like animals being killed for me to eat. Um, so I decided to make a principled stand and not eat it anymore. I'm now 25 and I still don't eat meat. Uh, my principles have changed now. I don't like the factory farming that goes on, but I still couldn't bring back meat into my diet. When I first decided not to eat meat, uh, I decided the best way to deal with it was to sm smuggle the sausages and meat under the table to my brother and deal with it that way or give bits to the cat. Um, because I thought if I told my mum and dad, they would be very angry about it and very worried. They were angry, you know, that I'd just been getting rid of the meat and not supplementing it with anything else. Uh, they thought it would be very hard for me to keep strong whether I was a dancer or not, in just as a normal child growing, they thought it would be very difficult for me to be vegetarian and keep getting everything I needed. A dancer's training is extremely strenuous and requires a lot of strength, which a vegetarian diet can provide. But in the past, Kate's parents weren't the only ones to express doubts. I once worked for a wonderful director um, who didn't think it was possible to be a dancer and a strong dancer if you were vegetarian. He was very surprised when he'd found out that I was vegetarian. I have to be very careful, obviously, that I'm getting enough protein, enough iron, lots of constituents of a diet that I need, but possibly no more careful than any of the other dancers who are very careful about what they eat, or athletes. We train very hard. Um, but I think one's diet is very much what you need, um, trial and error. A typical lunch when I'm working here, um, which is most of the year, would be probably a sandwich because it's quick and easy uh, with salad or cheese or avocado egg in it. Um, a yogurt, maybe some fruit. It doesn't differ from what everyone else eats, really. Uh, some people might have a meat sandwich, but I don't get laughed at in the green room because I've got some strange food. <laughs> At the moment we're working towards a piece called Sergeant Early's Dream and I haven't adapted my diet to do anything special, I just eat what I normally eat. If we're working particularly hard I'd probably eat more but I don't actually weigh up my food according to what I'm going to do that day. It just 
falls into a pattern of what I need. People say to me it must be very hard being vegetarian, but in fact I never think about it. I think young people who are becoming vegetarian need to be a bit wary when it comes to knocking out all the meat products and just putting cheese on toast in its place. You need to have a good, healthy, balanced diet. Now that means lots of nuts, grains, and pulses, which sound very confusing, but really they're just beans on toast and pasta with a tomato sauce and some green salad. It's actually very easy to have a very healthy diet. And one way to make it easier is to get yourself a really good cookbook and see the kitchen not as uh, an intimidating domain for adults, but actually an adventure playground with lots of new foods that you can discover beyond the beef burger. In order for food to be of use to the body, it needs to be digested. Digestion is the process by which food is broken down into simpler substances in order to be absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed around the body. Saliva in the mouth begins the job of breaking down the carbohydrates like starch. The part digested ball of food is swallowed and squeezed down the esophagus towards the stomach in a wave-like motion called peristalsis. It takes about six seconds for fairly solid food to go down, less than that for liquids. In the stomach, the food is mixed with digestive juices containing enzymes and hydrochloric acid, which is secreted from the glands in the stomach wall. These begin to break down the proteins, sugars and fats. The part digested food is squeezed into the small intestine through the duodenum. Digestive juices from the pancreas continue the breakdown of starches. Bile from the liver emulsifies the fats. Inside the small intestine, villi increase the surface area and aid absorption of small molecules into the bloodstream. By the time the mixture leaves the small intestine, almost all of the digestive food will have been absorbed through its walls. The rest travels very slowly through the colon, where the last stages of absorption take place. What is left is largely fibre, mixed with bacteria in the colon. This is finally expelled through the anus. During digestion, the body takes in what it needs from the food that you eat. If you take in more than you need on a daily basis, then the body stores the excess as fat. Now, fat's a very concentrated source of energy, so what this means is that you're carrying around a fuel source on your body. And Dr Mike Stroud is Director of Physiology Research at the Centre for Human Sciences in Farnborough. Mike, what are you going to do? Well, your body stores fat both inside it and under your skin. And if I measure how much fat you've got under your skin, particularly if I do it at different places around the body, then I can say how much you've got all in all. How much fat do you think I have? Well, I should think you're about average, about 25%. But if you wanted to reduce that, a good way of doing it would be through exercise. So have a go on the treadmill. So if we eat more than we need, then our body stores it as fat. But if you use up more energy than you take in as food, then you can lose that fat as well. Mike found that out the hard way. The British explorers, Sir Ranulph Fiennes and Dr Michael Stroud, have broken the record for the longest unsupported polar crossing. They've walked 1,257 miles across the Antarctic in 88 days, beating the previous record set in 1909 by 12 miles. The two men are suffering from frostbite and have lost a third of their body weight. It's thought they have now started on the final 37 miles needed to complete the crossing. Dr Mike Stroud and Sir Ranulph Fiennes both lost three and a half stone in weight, despite an extremely fatty diet. They carried everything they needed with them, and they had food especially prepared for the trip. Is this a typical menu then, Mike? Yes, that's what we had each day. It was dried food. Uh, we didn't have a kettle to add water to it, but we could melt the snow on the stove. It's muesli. Yeah, that was breakfast, a sort of hot porridge. Mmm, tomato soup. That was uh, in a thermos flask a couple of times a day. Cottage pie. 
Yes, that was the evening meal, and we had that along with this potato mix. Uh, sometimes mixing it together with the water, this powder, it, uh, you try to think of it as something else, perhaps your Christmas lunch or something. Can I try some? Yes, you're welcome. Put it in the bowl while I'll get the uh, kettle. All right, so we just add some water. And then this butter. And why the fat? Well, this is where all the energy came from. Fat has got many more calories in it than anything else, so we put a lot of butter into all our food. In fact, we put it in the drinks, in the breakfast, uh, and in the evening meal, and in the soup, and that gave us a lot of energy. In fact, if uh, you'd been eating a diet like this under normal circumstances, not exercising, you'd have put on about five stone over the time that we uh, did our trip. Who's going to try it first, you or me? I think you. <laughs> All right, here goes. Get another spoon here. Wish me luck. I'm trying to do that. I think it's quite nice. Yeah, it's okay. So this freeze-dried food has been specially prepared for Mike, with all the nutrients in it that he needed when he went on his trip across the Antarctic. But what about some of the pre-prepared foods that you might see in the shops? It all looks very tasty. But where does it stand nutritionally? One of the main things that affects the nutritional content of food is cooking or heating of food. It can reduce the vitamin content. It's particularly important in fruit, where fresh fruit will have a higher content of vitamins than cooked fruit. Food can be processed and packaged in many different forms. It can be canned, freeze-dried, dehydrated and frozen. A good alternative to fresh foods are frozen foods. They have been harvested and then frozen very rapidly after harvesting, so they haven't been kept hanging around very long. What can happen with fresh fruits and vegetables, it may take some time for them to get from the field to the shop, and therefore there may be some vitamin uh, loss during that process. Most foods carry labels, which give you some of the information you need. Use the knowledge you now have about nutrition and select the best diet you can. A healthy diet is a varied diet and it's also an enjoyable one. That means having plenty of bread, pasta, potato and other cereals, plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, some foods that are good for protein like fish, meat, eggs or vegetarian alternatives such as pulses, peas, beans and lentils, some dairy products and some, but not too much, fat, butter, margarine and oil, and some of the so-called fun foods, such as sweets, chocolates and snacks. The important thing is to enjoy the food, but to get the proportions right. What you eat is important. Food is used by the body for energy and growth. There's loads to choose from. So next time you're going to eat something, use your brain first. And make sure that your body is getting the fuel it really needs.